All right, guys, I think we're going to get started. I think we have a missing moderator, so we're going to do that job ourselves, but we'll make sure we get the code at the end because that's just a little bit of why we're here. <laughs> um, all right, I guess to introduce then, my name is Ali Spite. Uh, if you registered to come in for Ali Hyde, there's just been a slight name change. I'm still the same person. And uh, I am an occupational therapist, a clinical educator for motion composites, which we'll get into as well. Um, and yeah, we're gonna go over measurements and details today. And good afternoon. It's, I don't know if any of you have stood up here, but it's really hard to look out because those lights are very bright. So I'm gonna talk like this <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so it is the brightest thing I've ever seen. We can't really see you. Um, so my name's Jane Fontaine. I'm also an occupational therapist. I've been an OT for a long time, uh, since 1983. And in seating and sun capacity, I am now an independent manufacturer educator, and I do education for two companies, Motion Composites and Dynamic Healthcare Solutions, both Canadian companies. I'll nod her hat to Tina Rossler, who is a physical therapist, who also assisted us with this presentation. So a few disclaimers to start. We sort of went over one. We do work for um, manufacturers within the industry. That being said, this presentation doesn't necessarily have to do anything with that. They were just nice enough to lend us product. Um, and if you need to find us after, we're usually located somewhere around that booth. Other disclaimer, while we begin making this program, I wanted it to be a four hour long session. <laughs> I cannot fit the amount of info I wish I could into this one hour, so you'll understand the brevity of it, I guess, but we'll still understand the, the topic and the, um, the rationale behind why we wanna pay attention to details within manual wheelchairs. What you're not gonna get in this session, just to let you know, and if everyone stands up and leaves, I encourage you to sit, it's not gonna be a mat evaluation assessment, and you're not gonna get all the answers to the problems. What we're gonna do, what you will get out of this session, is we're gonna open your eyes to some of the difficulties within our industry, why education is important for us, um, and why, why what we do is hard, but why we need to pay attention to those details because of the outcomes that it will uh, improve for our client. It is CEU credit, so we will get some learning objectives as, um, as well. We'll go through key measurements for manual wheelchair setup, understanding how to take those measurements and translate them to order forms, the application of these and what does it really improve for our clients, but as well as applying these techniques to optimize that performance. Um, starting with that definition of what clinical decision making or um, working in an evidence-based practice way is, I believe is a great way to start any educational um, session, knowing that it's not just doing what research and evidence says. We go to a lot of sessions, we learn the research and evidence, and we will see that here today, but remembering that that's not the be-all, end-all. We also have to bring in our professional expertise, our clinical experience, our knowledge from past and present clients, but as well as the client evidence, the client's opinions, the client's um, knowledge on their history, on their goals as well, and together, that's actually what makes us better at our jobs and what really does improve outcomes for the user, which is the end goal. So why do details make a difference? So we're gonna talk about manual wheelchair, different, de manual wheelchair details. Why do we need to pay attention to them? Why is it so finite in what we do? There's, it's sort of um, a few reasons. Appropriateness of a wheelchair for someone. So the degree to which the wheelchair actually meets that client's needs, and this will um, translate to their functional health and their goals and their abilities. So the wheelchair quality, the durability, the customization to them. Uh, the inappropriate wheelchairs can cause those adverse consequences to functioning, safety, uh, vocational standards, social life within our clients. There's a really big abandonment rate within our um, industry, which is very unfortunate, and in tech industry as well, but within wheelchairs specifically, there was actually even a whole talk previously um, during this conference on wheelchair abandonment. And it has been found that other, either 31% of clients with strokes or even anywhere from 38 to 50% of clients with other diagnoses are actually abandoning their equipment before the anticipated end of the lifetime of the equipment. 
reasons for this being incorrect sizing, uh, the actual physical weight of the piece of equipment itself, of course, a change in the user's needs where they actually need to change categories of their program, but then as well as a lack of involvement in the prescription process from the client themselves. So remembering those three bubbles, that the client has that, that say as well, and without that um, part of it, we don't see good outcomes. Another reason for it is, of course, upper extremity health or just user health within general. Um, it is known that with our, within a manual wheelchair population that is self-propelling, 70 to 100% of your clients that you see in a manual wheelchair that you've even put in that manual wheelchair prescribed for them is going to have a form of shoulder pain. 70 to 100%. Those were lottery odds. Those are really good. When we're talking about something like an injury, it's, it's very unfortunate. And it is good to know that we have a lot of benefits within manual wheelchairs. It's why we, why we prescribe them, why we're all in this, injury, in this industry, is for the good, there can be bad with it. And we need to be very aware of that. It is found too that 68% of, of evaluated wheelchairs weren't actually suitable for their users. So we see that risk of abandonment and inappropriateness and the adverse consequences from it. I think it's important to note that degree of pain, derangement, disability is directional, directly proportional to the client's age or their length of time within the chair. And I like this statement because when we put it in layman's terms, what that means is no one's immune from it. If we're talking about um, a 20-year-old spinal cord injury going into their first wheelchair and potentially going to be in this until well into their 80s, they're at a very high risk because of the length of time they will be manually propelling. We're talking about geriatric, maybe someone who's 85 years old and going into their first wheelchair manually propelling, they're at a high risk of this due to their age. So really this is, uh, pertains to all of our clients. There are guidelines and recommendations. So research does tell us what we are supposed to be doing within uh, our industry for this. So we, we've had those references there and, and what we're gonna go through for this is, comes from that current research. I always highlight resina papers because if you're not in the education world or in the uh, research world, papers cost money and they're hard to find. So resina papers are there um, for us to use. They're free. You can always find them. And they have that good sum of the literature that's out there written in, I don't like to say layman's terms, but written in therapy-friendly terms um, for us to, to take those practice guidelines from. There's also a resina paper out there on wheelchair service provision. What are the steps we're supposed to go through to make these better outcomes for our clients as well? And it's looking from everything from body structures and functions, the activities and participation of the user, to as well as their environment and their current technology. These are the things we're supposed to be taking into account when we look into wheelchair procurement for our clients to get these proper outcomes. There are formal assessments as well as informal assessments that we can use and it's all of this information that we have to take in to get the proper product for our client in the end. I do like to point it out, this list could be very, very long when we're looking at clinical goals of manual wheelchairs, but what we tend to focus on is the mobility, the function, the independence. Like I said before, the good, the benefit of manual wheelchairs. It's why we all love what we do. If we start to consider some of the goals within our uh, prescription process with our client and educate them on it, that a goal can be to delay abandonment or poor outcomes or banish abandonment and poor outcomes, as well as delaying the onset of prevention of upper extremity injury dysfunction. If we start to have these either on our assessments as our goals or at least within our um, our process as our goals of this equipment procurement, how will we start to change what we do, which will better the outcomes for the client? So how do you do it, right? Is that why we're all here? Remember the answers? We're not gonna get your physical evaluation, and that's not where we're getting today. We're not gonna go through the MAD assessment. Hopefully you've attended one here before, in the past, in the future as one of your goals to do that physical examination, get comfortable with the, the hands-on manipulation. Uh, sit for the client sitting in chairs, a supine evaluation, use your team approach, the therapist and the, the ATP or the sales rep or assistants, everyone that you have, I believe two minds, three, four, it tends to be better than just the one when it's something so complex. And you, you should be formally trained in this as well. What we will focus more on is it's the translation. The stuff you get from your assessment, how does it translate to a piece of equipment? 
So in your mat evaluation, you'll gather your information, uh, pelvis, lumbar spine, uh, knees, hips, all the flexion, the range of motion, the strength. This is gonna tell us what does our client need out of not just the wheelchair, but their seating and their accessories as well. Um, and in sitting as well, you can on that firm surface, posture, balance, trunk support, pelvis. It's gonna dictate us not only in what they need out of their wheelchair, but what they are gonna be able to do with that wheelchair, and it's gonna allow us to go forward in those steps. So not exclusive for it, we're also going to do all of this in conjunction with the wheelchair assessments. So whether they've been done separately, it's always gathering information to put towards the wheelchair assessment. There are guidelines out there on measurement and technique, and there's lots of studies on how to do this properly, but it's very much in our industry known to vary between professionals. Um, and we have a great example of that coming up. But between us, even though there are guidelines on how to do this, when it comes to one therapist to another, one ATP to another, we see a huge variance in how things are done. The general practice does involve measuring those body segments and then translating them into equipment dimensions. Because as we'll go on to see, what you measure on the specific client does not always equal what becomes of the wheelchair. And this is where a lot of confusion within our industry can happen. And it involves your clinical judgment. You have to be confident in this as well as um, learn from it. One of the guidelines that, uh, that is out there that is something we can use as an industry is the application guide to standardizing wheelchair measurements. If we can all talk the same language, if we can all be trained in a certain way, uh, it will help us work together better, but as well as has, have these better outcomes for our clients. So by Kelly Wall and Barbara Crane, they were doing talks here this week as well. So if you attended that, you'll know a bit of insight into it. If not, you can find this resource online as well. The one thing I do want to point out, and that will help us explain sort of a few of the more physical things we'll go through, is that they talk about actual measurements of a client or of a body segment versus effective measurements or dimensions of a client and a body segment. So actual can be what you actually measure on them. Effective ends up being that translation into how do we want it to then look on a piece of equipment. And we'll have examples of that moving forward. These are the measurements that we will go through, basic in terms of our startup, but I think it'll open our eyes into some of the discrepancies that we see and the clinical part of what does this mean for our client if it's not what it needs to be for that specific person. So you can see the anatomical for the person and then the dimensions of the wheelchair can have different language and different terminology, but this is where that translation process happens. I might have OCD, I'm not really sure, I haven't been fully diagnosed, but I really like going through things and just knowing that those measurements that we're gonna go through, we're gonna dictate it into the three C's. So whether it's through the client measurement, the chair measurement, or the actual clinical of how they translate together. So I think I've made it nice and OCD to follow it. So we're gonna look at this, and if you really go back to what we're supposed to be doing in terms of our clinical decision making, you can essentially replace those bubbles with either the client, the chair, or that clinical practice that's gonna come into it. Jane's going to- Can I talk from over here? <laughs> Not so bright. Okay. Jane's going to um, tell us a story that will, will set up why sometimes we have different opinions in measurements. So uh, because I'm an educator, I do a lot of education seminars all over the world. And I've lately started for the last year, maybe almost two years, when I have a seminar, I ask three therapists to come up and measure me. And what's really interesting, uh, we would do it today, but it will take too long. I say, measure how you would measure somebody for a width of a chair or the width of the person, and but don't say the measurement out loud. And what's unfortunate or kind of sad is that within one sitting I can get three different measurements and I don't tell them how to measure we all measure differently um, some will go and get calipers if they have calipers it's actually probably the most correct in terms of it some will use a, a soft tape various things so I have personally been measured anywhere from 16 to 19 no 15 to 19 inches that's a four inch difference and I in one sitting. That's kind of sad that how differently we all measure. But then we go, okay, how are we gonna translate that? 
So I ask now, what size wheelchair would you ask your supplier to bring for your client to try? So say today you measured me at 17. Anybody want to say what size wheelchair would I would you ask somebody to get? I am, I won't go into the details of my disability and stuff, but basically I'm going to be a hand propeller. Let's just say that. Anybody? What? 18? So I heard a 17. 17? 19? Right? Look at that. I've gone from, did someone say 15? Okay. Flatter yourself, Jane. So this is what's really interesting. Sometimes I have more chairs than we have today. So I'm going to say the person, and I don't know who it was, but thank you, said 19. Um, I've lost weight, just saying. Um, we are taught in school to add an inch to each side. And I now ask why? Why should we add that inch on each side? I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm going to have you question, why do we do that? We just were taught that. but. Imagine a shoe two sizes too big for you. So why do we suddenly put an inch on each side? A lot of people say it's for the winter coat. So I'm going to say, okay, so how long do you wear your winter coat? It's about 1% of your wheelchair use time. So really we need to think about that. So 18, we go to 18. Eh, we're getting a little closer. So should, should I be touching my skin or not? That's another issue. Fair enough. So now I'm going to go into a 17 because we measured me at 17. And this one here is 17, correct? Yes. I'll just pull this back so it's... So we took the cushion out just so we're all the same. So now in 17, I'm touching, so that feels pretty good. Let's look at, can I push the chair? I can push the chair. I won't go too far, don't worry. Um, so it's okay. But what's really interesting for me personally, and it's only happened once in about a year and a half where someone squished my fattest part. So I'm very open about my body. And if you go to a mat eval, my fattest part is my mid thighs. It's actually not at my trochanters, just the way I'm shaped. Not everybody's the same. So we can't make these judgments. We have to add an inch to every side. It depends on the person and what they're going to do in their life and et cetera. So in fact, my fattest is quite squishable. And you know what size? I'm very lucky. I get to try different chairs. The size that I like and fit and feel most comfortable in, 15. Wow, isn't that interesting? Not one of you said 15. This now feels like it fits me. It feels like a shoe. It feels like an orthotic. It doesn't feel, and just look at the difference. If we were gonna, we don't have time, I don't know. I always get to talking too much, but about propulsion. My arms are not getting longer. So if we're looking at good setup propulsion, look at how I feel and how I present even versus when I go back to a 17. And it's a different type of chair. But do you see the difference that that does to me? It's just touching. But now what can I do? I can develop all sorts of lovely postures. So. We're not saying what the width should be. We're saying think about it for each client. Do you have? Oh, I love it. You love it's it? Just, it's one good example. I've been with Jane when she does this. We do those full day seminars and we have those people come and measure and it's, I think it's the highlight of her day yeah. when we do it. <laughs> We're just so excited to see what's out there. Not because these people are wrong in what they do. I always say, you could always find me a situation where where Jane is supposed to be, what did someone, Jane, they told Jane once she was supposed to be in a 21-inch 21 chair. 21, because I was measured at 19, so I should have a 21-inch chair, because we add an inch to each side. And I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm saying, tell me the situation. Tell me why the person needs their cat beside them at all times, and I'll say, perfect, that's one of the three yep. bubbles. If that's what you need, I'm, I'm all for it. 
if you can't tell me that reason, what are the reasons behind it, right? So it's opening our eyes to, are we paying enough attention to these details? What the true anatomical measurement we are supposed to take and what we're taught is trochanter width, so that hip trochanter width of our clients. Can that tissue be compressed? Are there risk factors in terms of skin health when it comes to that? Do we need growth options or the likelihood of that? These are all things that we have to start to consider, but the measurement that we do on in our evaluation is this trochanter width. The what ifs come into what if that's not the biggest part. Even when you squish, you don't squish. What if we're windswept? Jane does a good example. I've got um, a sore back though right now, so I'm a little. Uh, when you end up being windswept, you take up more of this chair in terms of width. And the issue can then be that you need a wider chair than what your trochanter width is when you're measuring potentially edema. And every single one of these what if lists that we go through is gonna have a dot, dot, dot. I'm open to any situation that's out there, but it's understanding that we do still take the anatomical measurement, but the what ifs can change it to an effective measurement for our clients. And I think if we can try and figure out a way to standardize how we measure, so using calipers is a more reliable a measuring tool and if you don't have calipers, if you get two sort of um, transfer boards and then you measure across because I, when people just use soft measuring tapes, that's when I get the discrepancy usually of the different measurements. I will say, sorry, one more thing. My mother, if I were to measure my mother and she's pretty close to using a wheelchair, I'm not putting her even if we're the same because her skin is unbelievably fragile, so I'm not going to squish her in. She's not going to like that feel. So I'm not saying it's for everybody. I just want to be really clear about that, to just really look at each client individually and put those three components together. Mm -hmm. okay. The answer to every question in therapy is, it depends. It depends. Yeah. Uh, the measurements from the manufacturers are good to know too, and most manufacturers are pretty consistent when it comes to it, but if you have a product you use a lot or you're switching between, like you should, for what's specifically right for that client, knowing where manufacturers measure from, because it, it generally is the same, but it's good to know those. So the equipment measurement, right, so our client hip width, is trochanter, trochanter, the equipment measurement is outside rail to outside rail, not always the upholstery width. So previously, maybe 10 years ago, even maybe five years ago, the upholstery always sat on top of the frame. And therefore, our upholstery width was our outside frame-to-frame -frame measurement. When we see technology start to change and we see seat rails going inside for lateral stability of our chairs, um, frame measurement, or sorry, frame width is still outside rail to outside rail, but just noticing that difference that it's no longer always upholstery width as well. So common things that do come up in it. <coughs> And then the clinical uh, behind it is the functional impact of it. Change showed us great posture that can happen. Our bodies want support. And when we have a disability, we have something that doesn't allow our, our um, skeleton or our muscles to do that support for us. We seek it from external things. Just like half of you or more probably have your legs crossed or potentially your arm crossed or you've, you're pushing up against the chair next to you for more support. Our clients will do that as well. And we'll get those adverse postures. It will change how you propel the chair. Um, oh, there we go. I don't know. Here I am again. Up individually. So Jane's clearly done this before. Uh, the efficiency of it. An 18 inch versus a 15 inch. You can see that angle of her shoulders. It is known that just one inch too wide for the specific client can decrease efficiency by up to 10%. Just like that. It doesn't matter the chair. It doesn't matter their technique. Just one inch too wide can be so adverse to do this. Um, yet yeah, we're taught one inch each side, still in school. I was at still a college the other day. Yep. And then like Jane said too, you wouldn't leave room in a prosthetic, would you? You have a client with an amputation, it needs to fit literally like a prosthetic, like a glove. Why do we do it in wheelchairs when this person is in that potentially longer than their prosthetic all day, every day to maximize their function? If you have a reason for it, it's, it's allowed. Okay. It yep. depends. Buttocks to popliteal fossa on the, fossa on the client. Uh, so your anatomical measurement. We're gonna look from uh, the back of your sacrum to the back of your popliteal fossa. It might not be the same bilaterally. Your actual measurement versus your effective measurements, it can change. The way your client's gonna sit, the amount of knee flexion they're gonna have when they sit, um, if they're gonna foot propel or not, these will change when it translates to wheelchair dimensions. But when you measure it on your client, it is this is our anatomical measurement. 
your what ifs that can change this are the other things such as kyphotic postures. So when Jane does a good kyphotic posture. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and this is where she's fixed. This is a, a, a fixed kyphosis. Her I should do it sideways, change. really. Yeah. <laughs> Her wheelchair jump changes within that. If you have a leg length discrepancy, it can be a huge what if and change that as well. So here's one depth. And then suddenly here's another, <laughs> right? So that's, apparently I do this very well. She's an OT and paid actor. Uh, dot, dot, dot. There's lots of functional things within our clients that can change what the beautiful diagram on the right represents. That's not every client, right? What are the realities and why do we change what we're, what we're taught to measure to translate properly to that proper fit wheelchair? Seat depth within the, a wheelchair is a measurement from the front of the back post to the front of the seat upholstery, the seat sling. Uh, your consideration in terms of this accessibility, right? Longer, longer depths tend, tend to lead to longer frames, not always. Your leg management, where is it gonna fall? Where is it going to, uh, is it gonna interfere with any part of this? And your back selection, sling backs versus rigid backs, the amount of space that they take up. Custom seating can be known to work wonders, but it can be four inches thick. Is that going to take up a lot of your seat depth? Do you need to accommodate for it? Take the anatomical measure, learn the effective measure, and translate it to the wheelchair so that it works well with the client. Just a comment up there, a common um, mistake that we do see, your seat depth does not equal your frame length. We won't get into frame length today, but just knowing that the depth of your actual upholstery is not the depth of your full frame, and your frame can dictate how your client sits within that upholstery. So clinical behind it, Jane's beautiful descriptions, as everyone can see, it can affect posture, your pelvic stability, your skin protection, or your, um, your susceptibility to pressure injuries, access to the wheels, accessibility within an environment. Your turning radius is going to be bigger if that frame is longer than you actually need it to be. Um, impact of seat slope, if we can start to, again, we're not going to get into seat slope directly, but if you can start to dump your clients down, your actual seat depth will be shorter than if they were to be in a flat surface. Things that we need to start thinking about as we're doing these, these precise measurements. And I always, you know, being short, don't know if people noticed, but um, I usually have seat depths that are too long for me, and a seat depth, and so this is actually the cushion depth in a way, but a half an inch too long, which this one is, if I get my bum to the back, my legs are not going over the edge, which happens a lot with cushions that are too long or seat depth too long. And consequently, in order for me to get my knee over, I have to get into that preferred perfect kyphotic posture, which is my normal posture because the chair has dictated that to me. Right, so, but as soon as I have, if this was now my back support here, it's a totally different scenario. These so things half an inch, a quarter of an inch can change everything. And these things can help explain to you why you're seeing these adverse effects out of your client, why you're seeing abnormal postures that you didn't, you weren't expecting in your mat evaluation or your sitting evaluation because you had them on a plinth and they moved forward to the point where they were comfortable to be able to do that or you set them up there because of it. If your measurements or your translations end up, end up being wrong to the wheelchair, you can start to see these consequences and need to take that step back and say, where, where did the, the translation go wrong and why, and, and can we fix it? And that's a plug for adjustable wheelchairs. It's, it's hard to get it right. I think once in my seven years of, of clinical practice with my clients did I ever go, oh my gosh, I don't think I need to touch anything, once. And I saw, say, eight clients a day. Um, so the, the adjustability that can be built into these chairs, this is why we look for those features as well, because no one is perfect on the first try. Seat to foot rest height uh, comes into play, again, in terms of adverse effects, but what we're looking for is popliteal fossa to heal, so the lower extremity. Um, is it the same bilaterally? Again, this is something can, that can change drastically and therefore has to be translated to the wheelchair in, in that form as well, to either be accommodated through the chair or accommodated for within accessories. What if there is a discrepancy? What if your foot angle um, 
is dictated. So if you're stuck in that plantar flexion or you're stuck in that dorsiflexion within your ankle, what if, if that's gonna dictate it? Because if your heel's now up here and you're taking palpatial fossa to heel, but your foot ends down here, Right, actual measurement versus the effective measurement that's going to be functional within the wheelchair. When you measure it on this, between most manufacturers, you're actually looking at a measurement that goes from the front of the seat upholstery down to where the foot plate, so apparently I don't have good lighting in my living room, where the foot plate attaches to the wheelchair. So this tends to be the pivot point of it, which means no matter where you've placed the depth of that wheelchair or of that foot plate, no matter the angle you've put it on, it's coming from that pivot point. So if you want to know the actual measurement within the chair, if we me took that tape measure and brought it to the front of the foot plate or the back, it can actually vary by inches within it. So general practice is to go from the seat upholstery to that pivot point of where the foot plate attaches to the wheelchair. You need to consider footwear. We should all be asking our clients, what's the most common pair of shoes you're gonna wear? What is the most common footwear you're gonna be in? Jane's alluded to it. We need to be prescribing for the 95% of the time and we accommodate for that, those other circumstances. So if it's, um, if it's a typical running shoe, we should be doing assessments within this because that can play on what our translation to the wheelchair amount will be. Yep. Um, so the clinical behind it, what it does, um, this is a, someone whose feet are stuck in that plant, um, fixed in that plantar flexion position, so we can see that how that measurement could have been off, but we need to accommodate for it. It can impact your stability, your positioning, it can cause sliding. If you don't have good support coming up from your lower extremities, you're gonna seek it. You're gonna move forward in the chair like Jane demonstrated uh, for seat depth, but as well as for positioning it's if you're, this you want the stability for it. And we can see these adverse consequences with our clients that we don't want. It's gonna affect pressure as well. If it's too low, it can cause sliding, causing friction, pressure injuries. If it's too high, it causes instability and increased pressure on your ITs. You can see how these measurements and these details in the translation of it um, can really benefit or, um, or have consequences for our clients. <laughs> <laughs> the high to trunk angle. It's really hard in wheelchairs to look at a specific part and take it out of the wheelchair and not consider a lot of other things within it. So if we are considering the angle of the client thigh to the client trunk, the anatomical measure is to place a goniometer over their greater trochanter, allowing one arm along that thigh and then one arm pointing up to your acromion. The, um, that's the, the ideal behind thigh to trunk angle. Typical angles we see are between 90 to 120 degrees, but a variety of clients can fall between 60 to 180 degrees. So there's a huge variance within this. The one thing to remember is it's not the angle of hip flexion. So thigh to trunk angle is not hip flexion. We're so used to in mat assessments or therapists of measuring things in terms of flexion and extension. So bear with me on this diagram. Um, we measure flexion of the hip by bringing the hip, so if we start at zero degrees by bringing the hip up, if your client can only get, say we're gonna pretend, to the 80 degree of hip flexion, the thigh to trunk angle potentially on the wheelchair is the other 100. Thigh to trunk angle, hip flexion angle, right? So this would be hip flexion up to 90 approximately. Um, you see how they're sort of, they're supplementary of each other to equal that 180? Makes sense, but we, we just want to make sure that when in that mat assessment when we're measuring hip flexion, that does not translate to side or back support angle or, um, or real, like the seat to back angle of the chair. They're supplementary measurements of each other. To confuse that even more, where you measure it on a wheelchair is actually between the upholstery and the back cane. So that goniometer that's on there going along the the frame up the back of the chair is where we'll get what the measurement for um, the wheelchair is and what we select on the order form. The difficult part is, is when you put your client in the chair, they're typically sitting on a cushion, hopefully, sitting on a cushion, you're not superimposing them on the actual chair angle. So if I go back to this slide. <coughs> and if you're so. having a hard time with this, so did I, just saying. <laughs> and my voice is not meant to speak on Thursday of the conference. Um, so 
basically what we're saying is that even if your hip flexion is 80 degrees, if you can only get to 80 degrees hip flexion, because we're not putting you in, in the exact line of the wheelchair, you actually might be able to get um, more, or sorry, less than 100 degrees in terms of your, your back, your um, seat to back angle of the wheelchair because you're actually gonna sit on top of it. So it doesn't mean it translates directly. It just means that you need to consider if the person's going on a one inch cushion versus a four inch cushion, those angles will change as well. So it's a good starting point. It's good to note hip flexion is not seat to back angle, um, which is a, a common mistake within our industry, but good to know that there's those differences and we need to account for the other factors that come into a wheelchair, right? Everyone's heard that in manual wheelchairs or wheelchairs in general, you get one thing right, you probably caused four other problems. 10. <laughs> Um, the clinical behind it, it's so client specific. It's a great place to have your trials within your clients and really make sure you're focusing on this and it can change with the client as well, just like everything else. Back height can dictate it, your seat slope, so um, back to, to seat angle, we didn't, it's just the angle relative to them. We didn't talk about if we actually start to slope the seat in a certain direction, but these will help, will cause those angles to change for the client and what's gonna work best for them. And if it's more open versus more closed, <coughs> sorry. Um, so you can see me in this diagram up here is that you, um, have that backrest that is a bit more open, you can see the posture that it, it caused me into that, and then maybe the more functional posture, because I can handle it, of the one on the right. All we changed within that picture is the back angle itself. The photo on the left, you can understand if you open it more, the effects that it could cause in terms of sliding, incorrect posture, potentially not being able to raise my arms as high for functional use, versus if you squeeze it, can I tolerate it? Or is it gonna cause me to move away from that backrest to change those angles? In terms of setup, but. Uh, we're told what to do with that too. So that's a few of our measurements. There's obviously a lot more within it, but hopefully it's opened our eyes to the details. When it comes to actually setting the chair up for the client as well, we need to look into where are we supposed to be putting those rear wheels. <clears throat> it's shown that vertical and horizontal position of rear wheels are two of the most important adjustments to minimize these issues we have with our upper extremities. I always like to say it should be a very big reminder. They're wheelchairs. The wheels really do have a big play within it. Uh, a certain position can decrease rolling resistance, decrease your stroke frequency for those repetitive strain injuries. You can have your a higher mechanical efficiency and increased maneuverability, all the things we want for our clients out of this. When it comes to our horizontal um, position, maybe I'll have Jane turn sideways. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. Research tells us we want to move the rear wheel as far forward as possible without compromising stability. Right? When we move the wheel forward, we tend to get more tippy rearward. It's so client specific. It's so individual to the user, to their skills, to what we need to be doing. But real, rear wheel forward, as far forward as you can without compromising that stability. Um, our trick within the industry, because it's hard to know, is that when arms are down by the side, like we have on Jane, um, if the middle finger and shoulder are in line with that center axle, it's a decent starting point. Then from there we go backwards or forwards based on our client's specific needs. Looking, because this is one of the most important measurements and yet it tends to be one of the hardest things to figure out in an assessment, especially without a wheelchair similar or, or your, even your seating product similar to what you're gonna be having, it does need to be figured out on the final dispensing in the procurement um, or within that trial that you can do with your client. That rule of thumb, like I said, axle adder in front of the shoulder is your good starting point. And then based on client specifics, you alter it from there. So I can actually, just within this as an assessment, I can pretend it's <coughs> narrower and suddenly I'm already starting to get better. And I can do a quick height adjustment. <laughs> So I'm still in my 17, but now I'm gonna squish up. And then I'm, do you see already I'm starting to have a better, and then if I go to my 15. Oof. Not everyone can start ripping cushions out from under their client. No, exactly. <laughs> Let's see how I am in this one. Cushions out. 
Sorry. That back. Okay. I don't know where I am. I haven't... Hmm, not bad. Maybe a little further forward, I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, and it's client-dependent. Maybe Jane doesn't have wheelchair skills, and so we keep it more stable. <laughs> um, but you can sort of see how everything intertwines together. Jane showed you just in changing the width how much better she was in terms of even accessing her wheels, and a big part of that as well comes to your vertical uh, position as well. So science research does tell us that when your hand is at the top of the hand rim, uh, you do want 60 to 80 degrees of flexion within your arm, so elbow flexion. Uh, sometimes in research we do see 100 to 120 degrees. It's supplementary angles, right? Everyone loves physics. If you have that 80 degree of flexion within your elbow, your outside angle that engineers love to measure tends to, is 100. If you have the 60 within your elbow of flexion, your outside measurement's the 120. So if you're reading it within research or you see it stated different ways, we're all learning about supplementary angles again. It can be difficult to, up to optimize that vertical wheel position for clients, uh, but what you want to look for is that limited shoulder elevation, reduced extension, decreased external rotation. And again, very important measurement, hard to visualize or, or set up specifically without your client being in their <laughs> physical wheelchair. Uh, but so a rule of thumb that it's nice that we start with is typically if you're anatomically average, I say, if your middle finger touches the rear axle like it does in this beautiful diagram, uh, when your arm goes to the top of the hand rim, you will most likely be within that 60 to 80 degree range. We are going to thank the research world for not saying it's supposed to be 72.8, right? They gave us a nice range. It's user dependent. It could, you could find an example that it should be outside of this, but at least we have our, our um, averages within it or something that's a base point for us. And if we have to move out of that, we do. But we can start with our, our um, our starting points in terms of it, and based on client specifics, alter from there. I do like to point out, it's a common question I get asked when I do sessions on uh, wheel placement, is how do you fix it? So how's this one set up for you, Jane? Oh, it's pretty good. Is this one the bad one? <laughs> I'll get Jane to pop into this one again. Yeah. <clears throat> is that if, if you're off, if you're sitting there, and I think what's gonna happen to Jane here is her hands, middle finger's not gonna touch that axle uh, within the wheelchair, so she's, she's off by a few inches. It's too low for her. There's ways to do this either through altering the wheel size or altering the position of the chair within the wheels if that makes sense. So I would say, uh, if, if it wasn't a, such a big room, um, which is great, but I would say, how would we change this for it? And the most common answer I get is lower the chair. Lower Jane within that frame more. To, and maybe then she'll be at our 60 degrees of flexion, things like that. Could be a good answer, could be a great solution in terms of it. What if Jane does sliding board transfers and this is her transfer height? And she's very stubborn and doesn't want to change it. Very stubborn. <laughs> or no, particular. <laughs> very particular. As I the uh, alternative that we can do is start to change her wheel size. And so manufacturers do offer 20, 22, 24, 25, 26 inch wheels, I would say is the typical. And this is where we start to see that potentially giving Jane a bigger wheel is going to bring that axle closer to her. Right? It's not all about the axle, it's about where her arm ends up in terms of where she's comfortable with her propulsion or more efficient in her propulsion. But we can start to see that there's two sort of ways that you can manipulate it and finding what makes it the right transfer height, wheel size, things like that for our clients. Understanding that 20 and 22 inch wheels aren't always the most maneuverable in the environment. So there's reasons that you would um, go bigger and, and maybe not have those ideal angles or, or alter the transfer height based on the need if the client can. You're not getting the answer of what to do for every one of your clients. They're all individual. Just paying attention to these details makes that difference for them. Yep. Optimal fit, optimal wheel position results in more efficient propulsion and the chair appears to roll easier and feel lighter. Our clients in manual wheelchairs tend to report their satisfaction with the chair in terms of it's so lightweight. 
I can take the exact same chair that someone had in, um, in an incorrect fit or an incorrect setup and make it proper for them. And a lot of the times the, what we hear back from them is, oh, it's so much easier to propel, which thank you, we did make it that way, or it's so much lighter. Yet we didn't actually change that or minusculely with, with sizes, right? If it's set up for them, this is the outcomes we get from our clients. This is what we want to strive for. So in terms of our case study, oh, we're doing good. Yep. Um, this is Jeremy, he's a, uh, a good friend of us. Uh, 24 years old when we did this case study, he has a T10 complete spinal cord injury. It was a workplace injury. Just a personal side of Jeremy, he lives with his girlfriend, hope, was hoping to return to work at this point, uh, which I believe he has now. Um, doing steel estimation for construction. So pretty active person. He enjoys skiing, surfing, hand cycling, hoping to try mountain biking at this time. Super, super active guy. On first appearance, Jeremy, you can tell that. He's a very active guy with his wheelchair. He wasn't a tie light TR, his Rojo cushion. Um, his, his concerns when he came to us and we said, what don't you like? At first, there wasn't actually that much. And then when you start asking the more detailed questions, He's finding his seat to floor height too high. Um, his actual footrest ended up being too high. To get under tables, he was actually having to take his feet off his foot plate and put them on the ground. Um, footrest, like I said, wasn't in that adequate position. His feet kept falling off. Had minimal slope in the chair, so poor seating posture, a spinal curvitation and rotation, which, oh, sorry, we'll get to. Uh, his legs tend to be ab abducted. Uh, due to this poor seating or poor placement of his lower extremities and was in posterior pelvic tilt. That's how Canadians spell it. Uh, he had fatigue by the end of the day and difficulty transferring into his vehicle. It's not how Canadians spell it, just saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this is Jeremy and his before. A big thing, did we say it, I think is you need to get your clients out of their wheelchairs to do the assessment. How many people, oh, yeah. how many people have done a wheelchair assessment with them in their chair? And if you don't put up your hand, you are lying. Look at your neighbor right now. And who hasn't had the client who refuses to get out of it? Um, I was a home care therapist. I was in their house. They could refuse to do whatever they wanted. Um, but we've all done it. We've all had those instances. Sometimes it's just what you have to do, and we're making the best of the situation. You can't force your client to get out. But you can see in Jeremy, this is him sitting, that spinal curvature. You can see from the back of it, black on black, of course, but scoliosis of the spine. So we thought we get Jeremy out of his chair, and he sat up with better posture than I did. His seating in his current chair was dictating this posture, and if we hadn't got him out of it, we would have prescribed for this. Am I doing my story? Sure. Jean has a good story Great about this. Great story about this. Just um, we've all done it, and we think we know people, but the chair does dictate the posture. So years and years ago, Joan Pageant, I've done this story with Joan, and some of you know Joan. Uh, we were in Seattle, and she asked a local therapist, could you bring in a client with some unique deformities, because I want to show how to do the mat eval and, and, and go through it. So in comes this client, and he had a leg length discrepancy, had a kyphoscoliosis, and um, which was perfect for Joan and um, not great for the guy, but that's okay. And she talked to him for a while and then she transferred him to the mat. And he sat perfectly straight. And the therapist thought he had fixed or progressing deformities. And so she goes, well, first of all, that's great for the guy, terrible for Joan, because she had three hours booked to show how to evaluate somebody with some you know, unique postures. So she looked at his chair and she removed the cushion and underneath was a drop seat, if any of you remember the drop seat where you take out the upholstery and you put in four hooks so you can give slope to a, a basic chair. And so there was two hooks in the front and two hooks in the back, except with his chair, the bottom left hook was missing. He had been sitting like this for a long time. That's why the therapist thought that was his posture. If we had not got him out of the chair, this is what we would have prescribed for him. How sad is that? And we've all done it. We all know we've done it. But if at all possible, you might not be able to do the full supine, but at least get them out so you can see what their body does out of the chair. And this, I am Canadian, out and about. Okay. 
She did the spelling. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so this is Jeremy. Like I said, his picture on the left, it, it's not awful. We weren't looking at him going, oh, poor Jeremy, right? But when you start to talk to him and you do that informal assessment, you begin to realize that there are concerns with it and things that he just thought he had to live with. Things that he thought, I don't know, I'm in a wheelchair now, this is how, this is what it does, and, and this, is, this is it. When we start to change certain things, lowering overall height, changing seat slope, uh, just by an inch to a total of two, reducing his seat width, I believe from a 16 to a 13, increasing his back angle to 93 degrees, um, increase that seat to foot rest for better positioning, you can start to see the better posture, the appropriate foot position, for better functional access. He can actually get under a table. And kind of a common thing with people, I think this was Jeremy's second chair. His first one he found very low and wasn't used to not being at eyesight with people. So on his next one, he dictated he wanted higher. He admitted he did that in the prescription. I want it higher. Someone didn't think about functional access for tables and he regretted it over, over time, but that non-adjustable chair didn't allow that to change. So he had that better functional access. We did end up changing chairs to be lighter, lifting it with one hand into a vehicle without having to seat belt himself in for two hands. And then increased energy at the end of the day, which is probably one of the best things. He was off work at the time. I remember him telling me that his, uh, he would hang out with his buddies uh, during the day when was at work. And by the time it was the end of the day and she actually wanted to hang out, he was too tired and exhausted and didn't want to go do things at the mall or go out shopping or, or do his active stuff because he had done that all day and was exhausted. When we make these changes, he was just like, I can do everything. I can hang out with my friends, my girlfriend, everyone's happy now, um, which is really what we want of those outcomes and the, the posture as well. So you can see by changing these fine details, Jeremy's first beginning picture wasn't it wasn't ghastly to us, it wasn't awful, but you can start to see these changes and these details and that more perfect fit and evaluation for him. Tighter fit, the more neutral legs, those well-supported feet and those neutral posture can, will make that difference for him. And that's really what it's all about for our clients. The wrap up of that basically is looking at those those three C's. If we all if that gets patented, that's my goal. Um, <laughs> but your assessment, your equipment, and the translation to it, it's hard, it's complex. We're not all experts on it. But the more we can realize the difficulties within this, the more it'll open our minds to, to learning more about it and learning from our past experiences and these future clients we're about to go see. And hopefully it's opened our eyes into the clinical side of it, the outcomes that we can get from it and the benefit to the client, which is the, the end goal within it. Trial what you can, approximate what you have to, but in the end, we want, we want to be there for these dispensings, for these fittings, and the full way through the process, because nothing will be complete until that final last last session that you have. Any questions? I'm supposed to leave time for questions. Yes. No. Oh, oh, you're the moderator. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. There's a question. You can. There's a mic right there if you want, or. Or yell. Because we can't hear or see you, really. <laughs> just so you know, it's like talking to a blank wall. So just curious, it was hard to tell on Jeremy. Did you close his his back angle three degrees or open it? When it said we increase not yeah. to 93, you we were closed closing. closed it more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we can go back. Oh, yeah, we didn't do the side picture at the beginning. So hard to tell. We did close his back angle. Any other questions? Oh, right. perfect. Well